little bit of information to share with you that we think is going to be helpful as you um, kind of uh, give information to your teachers, or if you are a teacher, give information to others around what an ERI code is, how it's determined, um, and things like that, best practices around it. So um, let's get started. So if you are new to GoToWebinar, this is your control panel. It's that box you see. If you want to make it small, you can actually click this little um, arrow. Uh, it should come, it's like a red uh, box with a white arrow. You can minimize your control box. Um, the red microphone uh, means that you're muted. If it's green, it means we can all hear you. Um, and this is the raise hand feature. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. I think our group is um, relatively small enough, so you can pretty much unmute yourself if you have a question. I will go ahead and unmute all of you in just a second. Um, we'll just kind of get through this beginning phase uh, for a minute. So you can also put in uh, your questions in the questions chat box in case you, you know, are in a noisy place and you don't want to unmute, you can go ahead and um, Put them in there as well and we'll get we'll get to you um so just a, a couple of things that the, the office hours traditionally are not a formal training this one is neither a formal training it really is just information for you and a space for you to ask your questions um, regarding the topic which is eri codes today again simply unmute if you have a question um, and this session is being recorded um, it will be posted to our data-driven instruction website um, usually they do it by the end of the week, so you can expect to see it in a couple of days. Um, and that is under our best practices section on the data-driven instruction website. Um, so we'll just review a couple of things first. Um, the statute, what the statute says regarding the ERI code, the purpose, definition, the intention behind it, really like, you know, it's sort of like the purpose, but a little bit different. Um, we'll, Mary will guide us through the tools and the cut scores, other sources of information that you can use to determine your ERI code, behaviors, which is uh, reading behaviors you can observe for, and timelines as well, and then some general information at the end. So I'm just going to give you, I'm not, I'm going to do you all a favor and not read all of this, but you can easily find it on our website. This is a copy paste of uh, the Texas Education Code 28006. Um, discussing how essentially administ the administration of a literacy assessment tool to support children in their literacy journey. And so that way um, teachers have information to adjust instruction. And it also covers um, the dyslexia screening as well. But again, I'm not going to read this all to you. You can find it on our website or rewatch this webinar if you'd like to. Um, but we kind of wanted to give you like the bullet points of um, Texas Education Code 28006. So the statute requires that schools do the following, and it's really three things. Administer the early reading instrument to all students in kindergarten and grades one and two to assess the reading development and comprehension. Um, and so particularly for this year and moving forward, those tools are, um, um, they must be commissioner approved unless you have a waiver. Um, Second thing, if on the basis of the reading instrument results, students are determined to be at risk for dyslexia or other reading difficulties, um, please ensure that you're notifying the students, parents, and guardians. Um, so we'll spend a little extra time on this second bullet today because um, some of us may be familiar with assessment tools that provide a report that give us direct ERI codes, and some of us are using tools that are different and don't provide those ERI codes. So we'll talk a little bit about what sources of information you can use from those tools um, and perhaps formative data as well to develop your ERI code. Um, and then the third thing is, um, of course, after you have this information and you've determined whether or not a child uh, requires accelerated reading instruction, which is really uh, tiered support, support and some intervention, um, to implement, implement that accelerated reading program that appropriately addresses the student's reading difficulties and enables them to catch up they're typically performing peers. So really what you're looking at, at is administering, the first bullet, administering a, a valid and reliable tool, it, um, analyzing those reports from the tool, perhaps with other formative data that you've collected to determine, does this child need accelerated reading instruction, which is more targeted intervention? And three, how are you gonna plan and implement for that? Um, 
So essentially that's, that's the intention and the purpose behind these things. Um, the ERI code determines whether a student is eligible for and will receive accelerated, accelerated reading instruction. And I think, you know, importantly, it supports teachers in knowing which students require that accelerated reading instruction um, in order to meet their literacy goals. And I can imagine that many of us are having students that, um, you know, their ERI scores may be looking different this year than in a typical non-COVID year. So this is particularly of great importance um, to see where those kids are and to give them the support they need right away. And Mary, I'm going to mute and give it to you so you can go over those uh, benchmarks. Okay, well, CLI Engage covers um, Tex Kia for the kindergarten and TPRI and um, Tejas Lay for, for first and second grade. And Tex Kia has um, three different designations. The green scores mean the student on a subtest is on track. The yellow is monitor, which means they're approaching the ben benchmark, and the red is um, need support, that they are well below benchmark. And in TPRI, it's developing and still developed and still developing. So they only have two. But as I was looking at Tejas later today, and I don't have that that one on here, but it has it too has three different designations that are green, yellow, and red. And um, anything below green is considered below grade level. And we'll talk about in a little while about what that difference is with the yellow and the red. Um, M class has four um, different designations. It's well above grade level, at grade level, below grade level, and well below grade level. And then FastBridge also has four, um, their college college pathway is um, less than is well let's start at the bottom the less than 75 percent is well below grade level and i think the others natalie will um animate in yes and then there they go and so they go to just below grade level on grade level and well above grade level i actually like the m class and the fast bridge that have well above grade level and in TexKia, you can tell what well, well above grade level is because you have the number of items and um, monitor would be right around where your cut score is. And so there's usually a lot of room for those upper ones, but those you need to have that data as well. And that's what we've been telling teachers and um, service centers that these kids are the ones that need enrichment. And, and so you have to be providing instruction at their level too. And, and so that's important. Okay. So here are the cut scores for M class. And again, this is how it looks on their student page, your class page, and it's color coded. The um, well above benchmark is, is blue and the um, on track is green and below benchmark is yellow and red is well below benchmark. And so if you look at, go ahead and animate Natalie. If you look at the different scores, the one at the top of the class page on the left shows a student that is pretty much at the um, below benchmark level. The student at the bottom is well above benchmark or at benchmark or well above because there's some blue and some green and one yellow. So here you can see where your whole class is and how many children in your class are um, below bench well below benchmark you've got 14 percent well above benchmark 50 percent well below benchmark and then 36 percent below benchmark and so i believe there's another one one more natalie yeah and again this shows just the disparity in your class where you may have some kids that are well above benchmark but then the whole the whole, you can look at your whole class and what probably needs to be taught several times a day in several settings. Here's um, CLI Engage, the two, two um, assessment tools, Text Kia, and you can see again that across the board, this is the literacy screener for kindergarten. And in the far right of, of the Text Kia is your composite score. 
And so you really have to look at that. And Natalie, I think something's going to animate. Yes. If you look at these two cases, the student on the bottom has two subtests that are above benchmark, but he has a big red flag in vocabulary. So you, you need to look at that. A teacher will need to look at that. Um, the other student um, above has comes out as a composite score as on monitor, but two of the three subtests are below benchmark. So you might want to, a teacher would want to do more assessment in those areas to, to fill in any gaps. We, we like to say, you know, a, a child could have a bad day on a test like this and it would not be indicative. So formative assessment would be important. There's also further subtests in TextKia that you can administer. Or if you're using a different tool after the literacy screener, that can fill in more gaps too. And then Tejas Lay will show you the um, the student on the top is all is all still developing, where the student on the bottom has some scatter. So something we want to talk about is that's a local decision for you all to decide what how many subtests should be yellow, red, or green in order to qualify for um, not needing accelerated instruction or needing accelerated instruction. And here's FastBridge, and again, it shows you color coding. The color coding is our friend, and it, it will give you the wide range where, remember we said pink was, um, oh gosh, I'm not even remember. Pink looks like it's in need of support. Is that right, Natalie? I can't see it, it's so small. Yeah, so it's kind of helpful to look at those exclamation parts. Yeah. Uh, it marks yes. um, those, that darker pink with the two is like, okay, they're very well below. Um, keep an eye on that. And then it also shows you on the right, on the left are individual scores, but on the right it shows you the percentages. So, okay. So when you're determining the ERA code, um, teachers can use e reading instrument data in conjunction with formative data, observations, and in partnerships with families. Children are episodic learners, and the data they produce may vary across time. That's what I was just talking about. The student may have had a bad day, or, you know, as we jokingly say, he might have gotten lucky that day. You know, if he's guessing, it, Maybe he guessed all of them and it just came out right. So here are some behaviors that are associated with reading difficulties that are from the um, dyslexia handbook that's on our site. And so it's, I'm not gonna read this list to you, but it really is important for teachers to notice behaviors over time with children and be aware of them. We did want to point out to aversion to print at the bottom, doesn't enjoy following along if a book is read aloud, is, is a pretty subjective observation. And Natalie pointed out earlier that culturally students are different with storytelling. And, and so they may not, books may not be part of their storytelling in their culture. And so be, be aware of that as well, but also know a student enjoying it may show, students can show enjoyment in many different ways. Okay, and then the next one is the kindergarten. Yeah, and, and just so you all know, ahead, as we, yeah, as we kind of look at these reading behaviors um, associated with our different age groups, preschool, kindergarten, first and second, some of these you may look at and you'll say, hey, well, I feel like that's pretty developmentally appropriate. And some of it may be for children. These are really just bullets to say, if after a lot of you know, time has passed and um, you've set up some intervention and we still have these behaviors, it's just something to look carefully at. This is by no means an exhaustive checklist to say, okay, you have, um, or you may have reading difficulty or not, you know, just, using this information plus your reports to take into consideration where that student might be. And so yes, I'll move into uh, the kindergarten one now. Okay, kindergarten and first grade, it's the same thing. There are, it, it starts getting more technical as kids should be gaining more skills. Um, 
difficulty decoding single words, um, difficulty identifying and manipulating sounds. Those are two that stick out to me. Difficulty remembering the names of letters and recalling their corresponding sounds. By the end of kindergarten, they should have all of that and definitely in first grade. Second and third grade, again, the norm is expected to be beginning to read. And so if, if you have students that have difficulty reading fluently, they have difficulty decoding unfamiliar words, or they rely on picture, picture clues, I think it, it starts to really show itself in second and third grade. Um, but the earlier we, we know through research, the earlier we can identify dyslexia or reading difficulties and provide interventions, the more impactful those interventions are. Here's our timelines for the fall. You begin by doing your assessment and then you interpret it. And then if needed, provide accelerated instruction. I think Natalie hit on this earlier that um, there may be more this year that need accelerated instruction just due to COVID slide, but those kids need accelerated instruction as well. Um, and then you enter the PEAMS code based on what your district decided to do um, by December 3rd into PEAMS. And it just follows right along as you provide accelerated ex, um, instruction um, in January, February, and then you assess and you interpret and you enter the PEAMS code by June 17th. Some districts use the same tool for their dyslexia screener in January for first grade and kindergarten at the end of the year for their ER, ERI code and dyslexia screener, and that's fine as long as it meets all of the um, required subtests for the dyslexia screener. Families must, be, what was that, that they have to be notified in writing within 60 days of administration? Scott, do you remember? I know in kindergarten, the literacy assessment, they need to be, I thought we talked about this this morning. Uh, yeah, I believe so. It, it's it's relative to the administration, yeah. So it's it's not like a set date. Okay. And then we have some um, resources here. So the information that um, Mary and I share can be located in the Dyslexia Handbook as well. So we always welcome you to reference that. Um, but there's also a really helpful FAQ around dyslexia and related disorders that was, um, that's pretty recent. So I do recommend checking those out. We can drop these links into the chat box as well for you all. Um, and of course, if you need additional information, you can always email us and visit our website, but I'm gonna open it up to you all now. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute uh, everybody. So that way you can unmute yourself when you have your questions. So just give me a minute. I have to kind of go down and do this individually per person. Okay, perfect. So if you have a question, you may go ahead and unmute. I do see someone has a hand too. And if for some reason you're struggling a little bit or, for, you know, it, it keeps saying that you are muted, just chat it to us and, and we can fix that issue for you. Let's see, Jennifer Samuel, do you have a question? I see your hand is up. I'm sorry, I need to click that hand. No question. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Just going back a little bit. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? And you don't have to raise your hand. You can just unmute. Let's see, Edna, I just unmuted you if you have a Thank question. Uh-huh. Hi there. And I don't know if I missed it, but you know, I, I was having a little bit of the technology issues, you know how that goes. But am yes. I to understand, and that's just the way things go nowadays. Am I to understand that um these uh, programs and or companies are offering the dyslexia uh, screener for free 
across the state of Texas, or is there a fee? All of these, all of these tools we went through are on the commissioner's list, which are provided at no cost, and all of them do provide a dys dyslexia screener. And how do we go about enrolling uh, for their free services of, uh, as far as the dyslexia screeners go? On our, we have a data-driven instruction web page that has all the um, contact information for the um, for each of the vendors. There's a tool, actual a tool selection guide in um, there's or tool selection, and it goes into great detail about each of these um, tools. Thank you, Natalie. So probably, yeah. There it is. Natalie, did you put it in the chat? The, yeah, actually, Scott, can you drop those links that we have in the PowerPoint into the chat? Um, and I'll go ahead and add this one in there as well. But I recommend, um, so like Mary said, um, when you go into the tool selection guide, um, are you, uh, you know, well, I get, well, it wouldn't be pre-K, but if you're looking more specifically for kindergarten, there, there you'll find a lot of information. Uh, kindergarten, first grade has the same kind of table set up kind of comparing what each tool offers, but um, yes, they meet, meet all those requirements. So I recommend just browsing, um, taking a good look at which one is gonna work best for you and your school community and, um, and selecting the best fit. Natalie, Thank you a, so much. there are a couple questions in the, in the question section. One is we have a waiver for another instrument. Is the cut point below grade level or significantly below grade level? So um, like Mary discussed, and, and whether it's a tool not on the commissioner's list or a tool on the commissioner's list, it, you are going to be using your report data to see, okay, does this child need accelerated reading instruction? Um, so it's important that you use your other formative data to give you that clarity and sense of, does this child need any type of intervention around literacy. Um, we can't say, you know, if it's within this much of the benchmark, they're at risk, and if that below benchmark, they're not at risk. You know, there's, it really is best to, first of all, speak with your vendors to, to decide, okay, um, what do we mean by at risk here in terms of your tool and how does your tool interpret that? But really the second thing, which I think is pretty important this year is looking at other sources of formative data like Mary said, they could have gotten very lucky on that day. Maybe they had an older brother or sister, you know, like helping them in their assessment. So you just, you know, it's important to take in different factors into consideration as we um, determine ERI codes. But we certainly cannot speak to, you know, the, the benchmark pieces and saying, okay, if they're in the yellow or if they're, you know, then they, they have a, you should mark them as a, a two or, they're in the blue, you mark them as a one. That is a conversation you should have with your vendors. And decide locally with your language arts team and, and your reading experts. But I also want to say we had this discussion a couple of weeks ago with some other TEA personnel, and we're not identifying them as having reading difficulties or dyslexia at this point. We're just identifying them as possibly being at risk for that. And, and so your kids that are on the cusp you might get some pretty big bang for your buck if you would provide interventions and get them up to grade level um, where it would be horrible if you said no they're not at risk because they're just below and then you get to do you get you start doing that second assessment submission and they're still below grade level where you've missed all this time to provide interventions so there's no there's no penalty for kids that you think are at risk and need interventions and accelerated instruction for giving it to them and and it's really a payoff if you get to that summer submission and they're on track so it's just something for you all to consider again all of this is a local decision that you you need to make um Yeah, absolutely. And there's um, another question that um, reads, do I understand correctly that each district determines the level that qualifies the student for accelerated reading? Yeah, you are correct in, in you know, 
again, it is a local decision. You are meeting with your teaching team, with your literacy coaches to say, well, what does this benchmark mean to us? What does monitor mean to us? Does that mean accelerated reading instruction? And again, with the emphasis on that, we're not at, uh, putting a label on anybody um, by giving them a one or a two. It really is just identifying, do you need intervention? And by intervention, we mean, are you going to be adjusting your instruction a little differently for this student? And so I see a lot of hands up. Um, you should be able to unmute. I'm going to do my best to continue to unmute you all. Um, let's see. I've unmuted quite a few of you, so just beware if you have a green microphone that we can all hear you. Hey, I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I may have missed this too. I was finishing up a duty. Um, in terms of that ERI code submission, you uh, kind of just briefly uh, referenced those zero, one, two, three kind of coding that those numbers. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? We use M class, and so I see you know our kiddos composite scores. I can see who's below, who's on grade level and above. Do we go in and then you know interpret that ourselves into the the zero through three system, um, or is that a report that's populated through the vendor? Yes, so you will be interpreting those scores, and so that's sort of the importance of the conversation Mary and I are having with you all today. Is like. Yes, you're going to look at your assessment report data, but you're also perhaps if it's your local decision to do this, you're going to be looking at your formative data and perhaps some work samples as well or some digital observations that you have if you're doing remote learning. M class will not populate this report for you. Um, actually, none of these will. Uh, CLI Engage, M class. Um, I do not believe Illuminate FastBridge populates the ERI code for you, and it's on a scale of zero, one, two. Okay, that that was actually my at risk coordinator has asked me with finding that pre populated report on in class. So since that doesn't exist, what we do is we kind of use their composite score and we can just put that into like an Excel document. <laughs> can you um, any more details on that kind of logistics? Well, it's just what we were talking about is start with your your score from your scientifically researched tool and, mm -hmm. and you get an overall picture. If a child in, say, for instance, you're doing M class and the child is well below um, grade level in all areas, that child is at risk for reading difficulties. And if you're if you have a child well above grade level, that child is not at risk. That child is doing fine. So it's those, it's the kids in the middle that you need to decide what your criteria is and then fill it in with other um, information from your any formative assessments you have if you need to and look at it. But again, there's no penalty for saying a if you feel like a child would benefit from accelerated instruction to actually give them that and help them close that gap this year. I, and me, Thank you. Just uh, as a little helper, I added in the chat box two links to different. Muted. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. It, it keeps Matt, you somehow got muted. Sorry. No, I kept automatically muting you. It was weird. Um, yeah. I added two links to the chat. They were both uh, to, to give some additional information about the ERI code submission. So it, one of them sh explains what the different codes mean, and the other one gives some special instructions about how to set it up or how to establish the code. So um, those two links in there should provide some additional information for you all. Did, I hope that helped. I mean, really, all you're looking at here is doing some data analysis, looking at your report data, perhaps some other formative data, and determining, does this child need accelerated reading instruction, yes or no? That's really the one and two of it with, it, with your ERI codes. It's, do they need it, yes or no? Is it a one or a two? Um, a zero is not assessed. Yeah, one is student eligible. For accelerated reading instruction, too, a student is not eligible for accelerated reading instruction. Um, and number three, a student was not assessed. 
there's a question about do they need to submit the ERI data for the fall snapshot date, which is this upcoming Friday, October 30th. Natalie, the, the date is December 3rd. Isn't that when the ERI code is due? That's correct. Um, uh, so what's actually helpful about um, our website is if you haven't taken a look and, uh, you know, I, I am hearing the, um, in the field that there is some confusion around the snapshot date. So I'm just going to show you, we actually have these really helpful requirements listed down, but um, the, a calendar that goes with it as well. So if we look at the first and second grade requirements, um, it'll actually tell you right there. I'll zoom in for you all. The PEAMS fall submission ERI code is not due until December 3rd. So you have quite a bit of time to collect that data and think about, you know, what is it going to be for this student? Although hopefully by that time you would have made a decision to say, all right, do they need accelerated reading instruction or not and implemented something. So that code is not due with the snapshot. That snapshot is mostly um, enrollment information. I believe um, it is not the snapshot date if you want to you know, put it clearly, the snapshot date is not assessment data. We are not collecting assessment data this month. Hi, I have questions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the explanation around the ERI code. So just, I'm going to reiterate, just make sure I understood. We look at the data, we set local criteria and determine the ERI code. Um, we use CLI Engage, but we did not purchase the Lion component. Um, a colleague of mine in another district that has it, she has said that the Lion report um, provides them with an ERI code. I don't know if there's anybody out there that has experience with the Lion component. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Lion, I think Tango in the past where TPRI was housed, they also give you an ERI code. Um, Again, it's, it really is just looking at, at the analysis of your data. Um, you can either have the tool do it for you based on the data that is gathered in the tool, or you can, depending again, how you want to move forward, you can take that, that tool-based data, the analysis from that report, and use formative assessment too to determine, okay, what does this child need? What, I think one of the, the questions that really helps me when I'm looking at um, looking at these kind of like conundrums is do the qualitative and do the quantitative data align or do they diverge? Does your um, TPRI or TexKia tell you something, paint a very different image of what you're seeing otherwise? And so that's where you need to bring all your information together to see, okay, does this child need accelerated reading instruction? Um, yes or no. And if you're not sure, you're on the side of caution, just like Mary said, you're not, there's no penalty for being a little extra cautious with children, especially since they've missed so much school. If you suspect at all, perhaps that they might need some accelerated reading instruction, you can provide that for them. That makes sense. Thank you so much. I do have two additional questions. One mm -hmm. is that I've heard that CLI Engage is going to report some data directly to um, our early childhood data system, but then we have to report demographics. I'm not really sure like what's my part and what automatically happens. So I would like more information about that. And then for the dyslexia screener, um, when I've gone to the dyslexia contact meetings, um, we were advised to use cut scores to determine at risk for dyslexia. But for ERI purposes, we're kind of using um, both formative um, and qualitative data to determine at risk for ERI. But are we going to use a cut score for the dyslexia screener? And is that on the website as well? Um, well, let me answer the second question. So in terms of data reporting, I think you, the first best step is to actually go to your ESC um, data champion. Sometimes, depending on how large your region is, um, you'll have an ESC data champion or a PEAMS champion. And those folks have been trained to essentially on, on what to expect of data collection this year, which includes kindergarten and how that process works. Um, I believe our ECDS team is going to be reaching out in the next day or two to the ESCs and their certified vendors 
on um, and giving them some information on the how to's and the next steps of what's going on and what to expect. But in a nutshell, if you are um, with CLI Engage and using Texkia or you are with Amplify and using MCLAS this year for kindergarten, um, that data is going to be manually sent to um, to TEA into our ECDS system. And all that's left is for LEAs to verify that. But training um, for you, if you should require it, should be given to you by your ESC. So I would start with them first, but you can always email us as well. And that's just for kindergarten, not the other. Just, yep, that's just for kindergarten this year. That, that, that kind of automatic process will be happening. And then um, your third question, I don't, I'm not sure if I can speak to it or if I um, maybe like I had a, a misunderstanding of the question, but you were asking rega regarding um, using benchmarks for your dyslexia code. Um, no, uh, last year when we completed the screening, we were advised to use um, the cut score, the overall score for students. Um, so I think last year we used um, Renaissance. And so if they were um, below or at risk overall, then we coded them at risk for dyslexia. Um, yes. But I don't know what score to use for um, CLI for um, TexKia and TPRI for dyslexia. TexKia and CLI Engage, or CLI Engage is, has office hours as well. And this is what, that would be a question for them. Um, mm -hmm. First graders, you need to have that dyslexia screener done by January 31st, and so I know they are preparing a training for that, and um, kindergarten, you do it end of the year. Right, thank you. So there was a question about, do we need to report the data in December and June for every student? And I'm assuming that that's referencing the ERI code. And we're actually having some conversations internally to determine how the statute um, addresses that because there's there's some degree of uncertainty still. So we will, we will try to get some clarity on that and get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna look in the chat box to see if we have any questions or again, Unmute. If you're unable to unmute, just let us know in the chat. We can go in and manually do it. Um, it's just a, a gets a little glitchy in the system sometimes. So and there's another question. Uh, does I Station cover the dyslexia screener at first and second grade? I can't speak to that. Um, it's not one of the approved tools, although if it is approved by our district committee, um, I would get in touch with the vendor and make sure that you have your dyslexia handbook ready to ensure that those um, components are aligned and that they meet those requirements that are stated in the handbook. Yeah, there there aren't a, there's not a list of assessment tools that directly align with the the dyslexia handbook requirements. So it's it's up to the districts to determine how to piece that together. If there is an assessment tool that does all of those, that's totally great. If you need to use two or three different ones and combine them, then that's acceptable as well. Yeah. Scott, I've kind of lost my place in the questions. <laughs> I don't know if you have a better grasp of the progression of them, but um, if you want to read them. There fine. are there aren't any new ones. Um, I answered a few through the chat or through the questions box that were not addressed out loud. Um, Everyone should be able to see those. I'll see if I can find some that I know we didn't talk about. There was a question about if a waiver is needed for first and second grade, and it is not. It is the district committee's decision with respect to what aligns to TEC 28006. There was a question about, can you use separate instruments in first and second grade for literacy and dyslexia screening? And you can. We just got a new question um, asking, 
how do I find out information about the seventh grade literacy assessment requirement? So we, we can't provide information on that because we don't have, the, we're not the people with the information. Um, but if you'd like to email us at early childhood education, we can certainly point you in the right direction. Now, there's a question about the calendar. Can you remember mm -hmm. the calendar is again on the TEA site? Oh, sure. So if you have not become familiar with our um, very exciting data-driven instruction website, <laughs> I recommend you bookmark it because we put a lot of updates on here and they're just so helpful. So I gave you all the link in the chat. We can drop it in there one more time. You can actually find it in the requirements section and it's broken down by grade level. So here's your pre-kindergarten calendar. And what's nice is that you have the visual representation there along with the text, um, the required and the best practices right there on the bottom. So um, you can find that again in the requirements section. The, the one caveat with the calendars is I believe the end date for pre-kindergarten has not been updated yet. Okay. Well, has it changed? And I don't think we've updated. It just was pushed back a week, I believe. Okay. So, if, like I said, make sure you bookmark this website because as the, the world changes around us, we are changing with it. So, we're ensuring that everything gets updated in a, in a pretty timely manner. One thing, too, is that um, you know, definitely check out the best practices and professional development section. If you have friends that couldn't quite make it to this webinar, they will be posted here and you can filter. You know, if you're looking for a professional learning webinar video, you can apply that and they're all here for you. So, um, you know, keep this website handy for yourself. Well, and one thing for the pre-K too is you have two submissions, the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And I believe you don't have to wait till the end of the year to um, submit both of them. You can submit the beginning of the year, beginning November 9th. November 9th, there you go. And and so that will make it easier on you if you if you do that. Yeah, so you can submit you want to your BOI or beginning of year uh, pre-kindergarten data as early as November 9th to get to get the process started and to be able to address any issues that come up within the data so that you don't have to do it all at the very end and do two sets of data, BOI and EOI. Renee, I just got a notification that says your hand has been up for 15 minutes. I apologize. You, um, you should be able to unmute. And Edna, I'm sorry. Well. I, I asked you questions already, but I forgot to click off of it. It's okay. Thank you so much. Um, I got two questions. I don't know if we already addressed them. Um, it says, do we need to report the data in December and June for every student? Um, can you, I think uh, Cheryl asked that question. Can you um, add a little more context to that? Sure. Uh, well, I think you addressed it that y'all were going to do some further conversations yeah. about which students would be assessed. <laughs> It's yeah, it's it's uh, it's not clear as to whether both times are required. It is required for all of the students, I believe. Mary and Natalie shake me off if I'm wrong here. But as far as do you have to provide it both times, I'm not 100 percent sure. So we're going to check on that. Yeah, that's I think that was my question is we have to report on every single student in first and second grade. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that was my understanding last year when we were talking with the uh, um, people in a different vision because we talked at length about the, you remember the ERI code, it was the dyslexia code for kindergarten that was waived by the, um, nothing was said about the ERI code, but I know that we give out um, and guidance based on the, that, yeah, so we just need to check that out. It's. The wording is is tricky, 
and and so we'll put probably put that on our DDI page when we the data driven instruction web page when we get an answer. Can I ask one more question? So what? And I'm kind of new to this world, as I'm sure many other people are. But what's the difference between the December and June report versus the January 31st ECI? I think is what it's called. January 31st is the dyslexia screener is you have to give the dyslexia screener by January 31st to all first graders. That's in statute. You don't report it until June in your um, dyslexia code indicator. Okay. So the only thing we have to report then is this December 3rd and June 17th PEAMS reporting. And and June seventeenth, you can. Re that's what we're going to find out if if it's required that you do the ERI code, the early reading indicator code for everybody. But the dyslexia code you do for K and one. In second grade, you only um, screen for dyslexia if you have concerns for about a student. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up your muted, Natalie. <laughs> Sure, I think you've asked another question um, and it says, did you say that our region center has information about the literacy assessments and dyslexia screeners? They will have information, so does our website. It really just depends on what you're looking at um, or what information you're looking for. If you have questions around specific data reporting or how you are going to report data, you'll definitely want to talk to your ESCs first, but you can also just email us and we can um, help to point you in the right direction. Okay, so got about a little over 10 minutes left. Um, just want to make sure that everyone has their questions answered. We know it's a pretty timely topic and um, there is some confusion out there. And then, then when there was something I wanted to mention that I, I thought I heard it a certain way, but I wanted to clarify. Someone was asking a question about, do we just have the submission in December and then in June? If you, for kindergarten, so there, the way the one thing we need to be aware of is that there are there are PEAM submissions and then there are ECDS submissions. So those are the PEAM submissions, but there is an ECDS submission in, which is due January twenty eighth for the kindergarten beginning of year. So if you use one of the commissioner approved vendors for that or tools for that, that's where they will submit the initial data for that, and then you can go in and you have to verify and then upload it into the system, and that's due. January 28th. So that's the beginning of year, um, basically the kindergarten readiness assessment that, or the screener that we do at the beginning of the year. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. So, you know, if you if you're new to a district and you've uh, been put in the very special position of data reporting, um, I'm going to put an email address in the chat um, so that you're familiar with it, because I'll, it's me. You'll talk to me mostly. Um, it's ecds at tea.texas.gov. And so I think that will help you all tremendously in trying to getting try to get a sense of who reports what, how, how do I know how to do it, where's the training for it, and all those questions. So I'll put that in the chat. So there was a question, will the December 3rd ERI data differ from the June ERI data? And if ideally, yes, it would. Um, this is what we're trying to verify whether you have to assess for it twice to then make different de determinations or not. And I forgot, I think we got some guidance, didn't we, from um, special populations about, and we have this in print somewhere about the different, um, what to use to define or to determine the ERI for the different times for the different submissions. And I don't know that off the top of my head. So we'll make some notes and um, as soon as there's clarification on some of these things, we'll be able to put them on our website. Um, and again, like I said, bookmark this website. We're constantly updating it, um, not necessarily changing guidance, but are, we are regularly updating with new information. Um, so we will certainly get back to that.
Okay, so we've got a few more minutes um, and I see some people have dropped off, which is totally fine. Once you get what you need, you're more than welcome to leave. Um, we're not going to keep you, but uh, if you do have questions, you do, you do have other things that are lingering, you're more than welcome to hang out. We can stay on here until 4 p.m. Um, but if not, thank you very much for joining us. This again is being recorded. Oopsie. This is being recorded. Um, so we will be able to put that onto our website under the best practices section. And don't be shy. Reach out if you need something. That's what we're here for. We want to make sure you have all the answers you need. So email us at earlychildhoodeducation at ta.texas.gov. Um, or you can also reach out to our data reporting inbox, which is ecds at ta.texas.gov. And we will have this recording available as soon as possible. We either it's a multi-step process. We upload it to YouTube, which then adds the captioning to it, and then we'll add it to our website. So it could be tomorrow, it could be Wednesday, but I can't imagine it would be much later than that. Looks like we just got another question. Sarah asked, are the dyslexia codes and ERI codes submitted at the same time? Sarah, I really recommend looking at the calendar. It helps me so much. Um, I used to get the dyslexia codes and ERI codes mixed up. Um, it really helps to go by grade level and then look at the calendar because it'll essentially tell you right there. So if you're asking um, for kindergarten, um, your ERI code is due December 3rd, and then you will um, submit your dyslexia screener June 17th. So again, we're going to um, share some guidance around whether or not the ERI code at the end of the year, who gets reported with that. Okay. So there was uh, another question just came through, Natalie. Uh, so ECDS is only for K, and it's due January 28th. Who okay. submits this to the state? So many good questions there. So ECDS is also for pre-K. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I'm beginning to think we should have a ECDS office hours, just all about ECDS and maybe um, a themes one as well. But um, let me go back and make sure that I, I See your entire question here. So give me a second. I'm going to pop it out. Make sure that I see. So is ECDS only for K? So like I said, no, it's also for pre-K. Um, it's due January 28th for kindergarten. The ECDS upload for kindergarten BOI literacy assessment data that is due January 28th. Who submits this to the state? LEAs do. Um, generally, you have a point person for data submission. Um, if you're unsure of who that is, or if you have been the lucky person who is selected to do this work, get in touch with your ESC immediately so you can get your training because it is um, a little involved in terms of the technical end. So uh, again, really re don't, don't be shy, reach out to your ESC or re reach out to us if you'd like, we can point you in the right direction. But um, I would actually ask your ESCs first who does this? Um, and they may know um, if you're new to the district that you may actually already have a person doing this and you haven't met them yet. It really all depends. And to, to help with that a little bit more is we should have a, a to the administrator addressed email going out later this week. I'm crossing my fingers here as I say that. And then also, I believe, did you mention, Natalie, didn't, isn't uh, ECDS team going to be releasing some information that would be helpful here? With respect to the data process, because essentially, if you're using M Class Texas or if you're using TexKia, the initial assessment data will be submitted into the to the TEA, and then you will add the the student information system data, and then you will go in and you will verify all of the data that's in the system, and you will make the final. You as the LEA will make the final submission. Mm -hmm. The ECDS data team will be sending direct correspondence to ESCs and um, 
vendors who may be supporting them in this process. So like I said, go to your ESC. They are your point person for all of this data uploading information. If uh, for some reason they have more questions than answers for you, you both can come to us. ECDS office hours would be an excellent option. I'm beginning to think so too. I think you can ex hopefully expect that sometime, I don't know, maybe uh, late November or December, we'll see. Um, we do have a few more uh, office hours coming up that are exciting, not all about data, not all about assessment. There's one on potty training coming up if you're interested in that as well, um, and all about um, the self-assessment rubric uh, for pre-K, so keep an eye out for that one. But yes, hopefully we can get an ECDS office hours and bring in some of the TSDS training team as well. We actually, the, the self-assessment will, will include pre-kindergarten and kindergarten for this, for this semester. Good, even better. All right, we have about two more minutes, like I said, or one more minute, but we'll hang on um, until a little after 4 p.m., but you are free to go. If you have any extra questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, even if you think it's silly, we are happy to help you in any way possible. If we don't have any more questions, I do have one question for you all. Tammy, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not even gonna try because I would butcher the heck out of it. Did Tammy have a question? <laughs> no, I just saw her name. I saw her name. <laughs> All right, so um, let's go ahead and end this, right? Is that okay, Scott and Mary? Sounds, sounds good to me. It sure is. We'll see you next time. All right, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Take care and stay warm. Bye-bye.